I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar tonight in partnership with the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our speakers, Dr. Joseph Senya and Michael Machusek from the Cleveland Clinic. They will be hosting our webinar this evening about building a high performing IP program with real time interoperative imaging. A little bit of the run of show in the first part of the webinar. Dr. Sisenya and Dr. Machusek are going to be speaking about a couple of predetermined topics, but then we're really going to open the floor up for a discussion. Um, we're looking for the audience to engage and drop questions in the chat. Because of this, the chat feature is enabled, so feel free to share your questions with us throughout the entire presentation. No worries about interrupting the flow. Um, we will be reviewing all the questions that come through, and then Dr. Uh, Sisenya and Machusek will be addressing them throughout the entire hour. On that note, I will hand it over to you both to begin the discussion. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Kayla. All right. Just, ver <clears throat> just verify you can see this, yeah? Looks great. It might be the first time I ever got it right on the first shot. Okay, All right, Mike. so uh, as Kayla mentioned, I'm Mike Machuzak. Uh, the other good looking gentleman right there is Joe Sassinia. We've been partners together for a little more than a decade. Uh, and you know, fortunately, we work at a spot. If you can go to the next slide, please, Joe. Uh, we work at a, a spot that uh, has uh, an abundance of resources. Uh, we've got 11 board certified IP docs, but we also have about five or six other advanced diagnostic bronchoscopists that work with us. Uh, and the main campus is where uh, I spend most of my time. I spend all of my time there. Uh, and on the main campus, you know, we're fortunate. We've got three bronch rooms. They run five days a week with anesthesia, and we've got a lot of technologies. We've got Body Vision, which we're going to talk about a fair bit in this, and, and thank you to Body Vision for sponsoring this. Uh, we've got the Monarch, we've got an Ion, uh, all on the main campus, as well as a Lumicite, then the standard manual bronchoscopes, radial EBUS, uh, and we're fortunate in two of those three rooms, we also have a, a SIO spin from Siemens. The Fairview was the first satellite to come on board, and Jill really took that uh, bull by the horns there and got that program up and running in no time. So it's one bronc room. They're going to, to three days a week. Right now they're two, uh, but going to three days a week in, in uh, the next year. And for technologies, uh, we had our second body vision system placed there, and more recently a NOAA Galaxy robot. And additionally, they've also got radial EVS with the traditional bronchoscopes. And then Marymount uh, was a third satellite that we brought in for advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy, which is one bronch room, two days a week presently, also going to three days a week in 2024. And uh, they're fortunate there. They have an ion. They've also got a lumicite and the standard bronchs and, and radial EVS. So uh, one of the problems that everyone who does diagnostic bronchoscopy, particularly for peripheral pulmonary lesions, has encountered is we're not as good as we'd like to be. And why is that? Well, there seems to be growing evidence that CT to body divergence really is the cause. And what is CT to body divergence? Well, that's where we have a preoperative CT scan that shows us the virtual target that we want to go after. And then when we're in the procedure, we might be told by whatever navigation system we're using that we're right on that but we found that we actually aren't where we want to be. There's a divergence from the CAT scan to the actual body that we're working in. Uh, what we're looking for is something that's more akin to a bullseye or a tool and lesion. But Joe's going to talk a little, bit, a little bit more about the CT to body divergence using some recent publications. Thanks, Mike. This is a, this is a, a study that, that if you've ever come and see any of my talks, I, I include this in just about everything that I do, and I, I should probably give Mike Christian Jen Mattingly uh, royalties for as many times as I used it, but what, what they did, and, and everybody everybody probably knows Mike. Uh, Mike uh, is one of the innovators of of doing bronchoscopy in uh, cone beam suite, and being able to leverage that cone beam imaging to uh, to really produce a lot of great data, and the work that these guys did really uh, they completely changed our field and and really set the field off in the right direction. What they did was. As Mike said, they, they identified where that nodule was on the pre-procedure CT in uh, you know, 3D coordinates. During the procedure, they navigated out to where the, um, <clears throat> where the technology told them the nodule would be, and then they did a cone beam CT, uh, recognized where the nodule was, got the 3D coordinates of that within that space, and then measured the distance between the target centers, between where it should have been and where it was, and they did a further analysis 
of volume to see how much of that volume overlapped uh, between the uh, their procedural CT position and the actual position during the procedure. And what they found was pretty startling that in up to 30% of patients or 30% of nodules, there was no overlap whatsoever. Um, and then in another 30% of patients, there was only a zero to 25% overlap. So in almost two thirds of their patients, the overlap was 25% or less, which when you think about it, if you're aiming towards a virtual target and that virtual target is, is not even overlapping where the real time target is, it's going to affect your yield. In uh, Mike's study, this is with electromagnetic navigation. So this is a older Super D study, um, but still uh, found an average divergence in the upper lobes of around 12 millimeters and an average divergence of uh, in the lower lobes of 18 millimeters. So pretty significant when you think about it, right? Because an 18 millimeter divergence, what kind of nodules are we going after? 15, 20 millimeter nodules? And an average divergence of 18 means that that right here, just what you're seeing, that 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 none of these nodules that you're aiming at might actually be there. <clears throat> this is a uh, shape sensing. So when shape sensing first came out, their claim to fame was, oh, "This is so much better than AM navigation. It's much more accurate." And for a while, everybody kind of thought it was until another cone beam study was done. This is out of the Mayo. This is Janani Reisenauer's group, and uh, they did uh, uh, shape sensing, which is obviously the ion. And they found very similar numbers to Mike, that the median divergence in the upper lobe was 10 millimeters and the lower lobes 21 millimeters. And their bar for overlap was even less than Mike's. Their bar for overlap was 10%. And if you look at all the nodules that had 10% overlap or less, that was 35% of their upper lobe nodules and three quarters, 73% of their lower lobe nodules had minimal, if any, overlaps. Pretty, uh, pretty startling. Uh, when we first saw it, but these are these are true numbers. So um, things to keep in mind, right? So how do we how do we overcome how do we overcome this? How do we overcome the CT body divergence? Well, there's a lot of different ways, and um, uh, we'll talk about them in a second. But I think Mike will talk to you a little bit about the studies pre-targeting and and show you the reported diagnostic yields from these. Yeah, as we talked about, uh, we didn't we didn't realize or appreciate the extent of what CT to body divergence was with this virtual target versus where we are actually biopsying. So for a long time, we've been faced with this conundrum, whether it's EMN navigation or any one of the robots that are available, we've always demonstrated that we can get to the lesion with some kind of confirmation. Typically it was a radial EBUS confirmation and we would navigate to the spot with a very high percent, a very high percentage of the time. However, we weren't getting an answer anywhere near. There was this big diagnostic drop. And this is a few of the more recent studies using both EMN and both robots that were available at the time of these publications. And what we found is we weren't cracking 80%. Even though we were getting to the location almost all of the time, we still weren't able to get an answer. So why is that? What's different about what we do and why aren't we getting an answer that is in the 90% or, or higher range? And if we look at our, our IR colleagues, well, they have demonstrated for 15 plus years that they've been getting a 90 plus 92 percent yield on their biopsies. Now, you can make an argument that maybe there are some more complications there is in staging, et cetera. We're not going to get into that now. But the, the bottom line is they get an answer 92 plus percent of the time. And why is that? Well, what most people seem to think now is that it's because they have actual intraoperative imaging that shows the needle is in their, their target or the tool is in the lesion. And that is the phrase that has become very popular and really what most people are now referring to as the standard uh, as far as diagnostic procedures. And this was all brought about because with cone beam technology, we could now see in real time, where are we biopsying versus where do we think we were biopsying? So let's move on to the next slide. So, so let me diverge, uh, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, just slightly from uh, from where you are, Mike, because because what the CT guys do, as Mike said, is you know, they have a CAT scanner, uh, which is the highest end of type of imaging, and they're putting a needle in the nodule and they're using a CAT scanner to to do that. And that obviously that's not very practical for what we do. 
Um, but but as I said before, uh, some people in the U.S. Uh, you know, early on, Mike Pritchett, Chris Bodras, several others started to take advantage of cone beam imaging. Um, and so, you know, as I've as I've uh, talked it from place to place, conference to conference, I've I've noticed that there's not so much understanding of what cone beam imaging actually is. A lot of people think it's the same as the the, the CAT scanner that you have in your radiology suite. Um, uh, is, uh, it's not. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to talk a little bit about cone beam imaging. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about digital tomography. Um, because I think uh, once we sort of set the standard or, or, or set 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 a, a kind of a baseline understanding, we could kind of move forward with what, what we want to do next. Uh, uh, your conventional CT scan in in your radiology department is a is a fan beam emitter, okay? And you could see by the by the imaging here, it's a fan beam emitter. That emitter is spun around the patient in a helical pattern. Um, uh, a detector moves along with it. And they take all this imaging and it creates, uh, send it through an algorithm, creates a 3D image. They get a tremendous amount of data by doing this. Um, uh, uh, but you know, this is the highest of all high-end machines. A cone beam emitter is not a, is not what uh, what we use in the radiology suite. It's not a fan beam emitter. It's to, it's a cone beam emitter, and that's why we call it a cone beam. Uh, that's why we call things cone beam CTs. It's a cone beam emitter. It sends out a radiation uh, a beam that's in a cone shaped. It hits a detector and it creates a 2D image. Okay. Now, if you could spin that around and 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 do images every degree or half a degree as you move around uh, uh, the gantry, um, or sorry, you move around the patient, uh, you'll get a series of images which could then be put together via an algorithm to create a 3D image. Okay. Um, Larger high-end fluoroscopy systems are able to do very wide type of spins, 180, 200 degrees rotation, and they create these very, uh, uh, very detailed 3D images. And this is what we all know as cone beam CT. Digital tomosynthesis, however, or, or digital tomos, or, or digital tomo, or DT or tomo, is an imaging modality that also uses a cone beam emitter. OK, a cone beam emitter is pretty much what's on everybody's fluoroscope or uh, fluoroscope machine. It's the same emitter, same, same, same physics, same everything. The only difference between a cone beam CT and digital Tomo is that this cone beam emitter has a limited angle sweep, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. And this is what differentiates it from cone beam CT. It's the same process. It's the same imaging. It's the somewhat of the same algorithms. It's just that by convention, a cone beam CT is generally 180 degrees more of a sweep, whereas digital Tomo is, is a more mitigated sweep, somewhere between 60 and 100 degrees. As a result, you don't get as much data um, with, the, uh, with, the, with digital Tomo, and you have to be more clever in how you collect your image. Um, you could see that if you do your image right, your di digital Tomo will give you very valid images very uh, images very similar to what you're seeing in cone beam CT. Now, if you look at the dog on the left, this is a this is a, an analogy to a cone beam CT. You have a, a very wide angle sweep. You get a lot, a lot of data. You could reconstruct an image that's very detailed and has uh, and, and has depth to it. With DT or Tomo, because you have a limited angle sweep, right? Everything, the images that are coming through where all the images are kind of intersecting as you go around, that's called isocenter. The image uh, that, uh, uh, that, that occurs at isocenter is very detailed. And the further back you go, uh, becomes more blurry. And we, you know, we call that a shallower depth of focus. So <clears throat> what does that mean to us? That means that if you're going to use digital TOMO or, 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 or any kind of TOMO in your, um, uh, any kind of DT in your, procedure, so not a cone beam, digital TOMO, that you have to ensure that the nodule that you're imaging is isocentered. Okay. It's kind of difficult to do um, if you don't know where the nodule is and you can't see it. However, what you'll see a little bit later, what uh, 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 lung vision has figured out is how to do that uh, without using a cone beam, uh, a cone beam wide angle, high end kind of sweep. Now, what are the things uh, uh, that kind of go into uh, how good your image is with DT? Well, first of all, it's your um, <clears throat> it's your detector. So some of the older detectors that you might have in your rock suite um, are analog, like a GE9900. 
So there you do your limited angle sweep, you do your, your you do your x-ray, it hits a it hits a, a a detector, which then has to go through this image intensifier, which hits a video camera, which has an analog output. It goes into this thing called an ADC, which converts the analog uh, 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 signal into a digital signal, goes into a computer, a, uh, 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 an algorithm is applied and an image is created. A flat panel is usually a, a, a more high-end type of detector. It's a digital detector, so everything that hits it is digitized immediately. That directly goes into a computer and uh, generally provides more data than the image intensifier does. Um, the result, the resultant image is a better image. Now I'm not gonna, gonna pass through this for the sake of time. So the if, the factors that will affect your image quality in digital Tomo is the type of detector do you have? Do you have a flat panel, or do you not have, a, or do you have an analog uh, uh, non-flat panel? The algorithm that you use becomes very, very important because you have all this data, and what can the algorithm do to put this data together and create an image? Pretty much the algorithm is, 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 is the analogy here would be your uh, uh, Adobe uh, Photoshop. What kind, of, what kind of things can you apply to the image to make it crisp and give you the information that you need? And then the sweep angle. Obviously, the larger the sweep angle, the more data you're going to get and the better imaging you're going to get. Now, there are other big differences uh, between digital Tomo and cone beam. Cone beam, because it's a wider angle sweep, requires a lot more, a lot more radiation, 10 times more than almost than uh, uh, what a, 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 a Tomo image requires. And if you look uh, at the right panel, you'll see that a cone beam image requires, uh, uh, generally has a higher effective dose than even a conventional CT. So huge doses with cone beam CT, if you ever, you ever seen somebody do it, people actually have to step out of the room, you do the cone beam sweep, and then you go back into the room and people leave the room because there's so much, there's so much radiation. That's used. 3D Tomo, the radiation is significantly mitigated. Now, cone beam CT is not, you know, a viable option for most institutions. A lot of people don't have it. A lot of people aren't Chris Badra. A lot of people aren't uh, uh, Mike Pritchett, who have it at their disposal. At Cleveland Clinic, uh, we're lucky to get it once or twice a month, and the reason for that is our our vascular uh, IR guys are in there using it all the time. Um, it's also uh, very costly. So if, if if you don't have one, you want to buy one. These fixed cone beam systems are super expensive, over a million dollars. The um, uh, the mobile cone beam systems, like a, like a, like a Sios, are also super expensive, oh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. We already talked about the high radiation exposure, and again, even if you have a, a, a cone beam system, you may not have access to it at all. Um, the other thing that a lot of cone beams don't have, and it kind of depends on your software package, is, is augmented fluoroscopy. Mike's going to talk a little bit about the advantage of, 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 of augmented fluoroscopy in a second, but I want you to kind of put this in your head and, uh, and, and remember it. Not all, not all cone beam systems, certainly not the SIOS, has augmented fluoroscopy, which you know we, Mike and I feel are, is, a, is an advantageous feature to have. So, so with that in mind, why don't we just segue now back um, uh, 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 into uh, what lung vision is, and I'm going to hand this off to Mike. Thanks, Joe. So we'll talk a little bit about the lung vision system. Uh, there's kind of three parts. There's the body board, which sits underneath the patient on your bed. You've got the main processing unit, which you see all the way to the left-hand side of the screen. And then there's a pad, and that pad can be uh, is presently on a, uh, a roller uh, stand. So the nice thing about it is it takes up a small piece of your actual space. Uh, even, even at our facility, we don't have space to spare. So a small footprint is really important when we're looking at what we're going to add to our system. When you bring in a robot, you bring in a SIO spin, you've got one or two towers that are in there, an anesthesia machine, the table, the prep and work table, Two assistants, the proceduralist, and uh, in our case, a fellow uh, of some level, the room can get crowded very quickly. So anything that has a small footprint is is really of incredible value. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Joe. Mike, I just want you to I just want to point out here that the lung vision will work with any CRM technology that you have. So if you have a if you have an analog uh, GE 9900, if you have a SIOS. The thing about the lung vision is the lung vision provides the reconstruction algorithm. If any of you use a SIOS, right, you do a 3D spin on a SIOS, the SIOS has its own sort of algorithm that reconstructs the image. 
That's not what Long Vision does. It, it only takes the digital data or the analog data that's been converted into, into digital data and they, they apply their own algorithms. So it can work with any fluoroscopy machine, whether it be SIOS, GE 9800, 9900, the Brevo system, so on and so forth. So, so uh, remember that, you know, as Mike is saying, how versatile this thing is, it's, it, it's footprint and it's also versatile. It can adapt to any technology that you have in your room. And some of that will come into play uh, both at, in this slide and some slides later when we talk about this, because what you're going to see is images with lung vision attached to the SIO spin, which is the half a million dollar piece of equipment Joe referenced earlier, as well as some of the more primitive C arms that are available. Uh, and you're going to see some of the images that are obtained with both of those. As far as as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but really any any C arm that's out there right now, this will work with. So every hospital that I've ever worked in or, or folks that I've talked with, there are C-arms that are accessible in any aspect. So it doesn't have to be a super expensive system to get really nice images. And again, we'll show you some of those images in just a little bit. So how, how this system works, for those that have done navigation bronchoscopy or an advanced bronchoscopy in some way, the first part is the same. We get a CAT scan, you get that CAT scan, you mark the spot, and then you sort of work out segmentation and a pathway to that spot. Once you've done that, then you're ready to kind of start the procedure. And if you look at the second slide, you see all these little dots. They're on that body board that I referenced earlier. And that's basically points of reference that will allow the system to give you a sense of not just where it is left to right, but also top to bottom. And as you go, you're gonna to have to set up this system appropriately. So we're gonna mark the main carina, we mark that main carina, and that kind of gives everything a starting point. But we're also going to work this both um, in the RAO and the LAO. Now, a wider swing is better because it's going to allow the system to collect more data. Uh, and this is where we're going to get that 3D reconstruction. So that's going to give us an idea of where the main carina sits, where all the airways sit. And then we're going to ISO center. And if you remember Joe's images of that dog on both sides, we're going to ISO center now on that lesion. And as we ISO center on that lesion, that's going to tell us where we are. Now, if you look at that middle uh, image again, you see the forceps and the needle going right on that lesion, right? We've all been there where we see that and we're right on that spot. We don't get an answer because we're not in the right plane on the AP or in, in the anterior to posterior. We might look at it right on, but if we shoot an RAO or an LAO, we'd see we're either in front of it or behind it. And that's one of the beauties of augmented fluoro because whether I'm in an RAO or an LAO, that still gives me this superimposed target to go after so I know where I'm going to be. Joe talked about tomosynthesis. So basically, if you have this tomosynthesis and this reconstruction, and then you're going to add on the nodule from that first preoperative CAT scan, that's going to give you your first target to after. But as you go, if you're not getting an answer, you can do another spin. That other spin will update that target to where it is. So if we do have a CT to body divergence, that second spin or third spin is going to update where we are. And that gives us a much better idea and, and can improve our accuracy going after that nodule. And as Joe said, this works on its own with the catheter that's provided by lung vision, body vision. You can use this with a thin scope. You can use it with a standard scope. You can use this with an extended working channel from another system. You can use this with any robot as well. And that I think is really the beauty of this is this takes really good technology, but then bumps it up one level. Uh, so once we've got that, and I talked about doing an additional spin, when you do that spin, if you look at that third panel coming down, that gives you an actual 3D image that you can spin and rotate and see where am I relative to the target. And as you've done that second spin, you've now got an updated target. So you know you're going where you want to go, not just based on that preoperative CAT scan and some virtual target that may not be within two centimeters of where you want to go. Anything you want to add there, Joe, or should we move on? No, I, I think I think I think you uh, you characterized it uh, uh, pretty well. The important thing here, I think, is that uh, is that by doing that, uh, marking the main carina. You do a digital, like Mike said, you did a spin, digital tomo, you identify the carina in both the pre-CT and then in real in real time. And then based on that, their algorithm will actually calculate where you need to move your fluoroscopy machine to find isocenter. It'll tell you to move it six centimeters inferior. It'll tell you to increase the distance between the, the detector and the and the patient's chest. It'll it'll tell you all these things. So your so your next spin, you know that that 
nodule will be as close to isocenter as possible. You mark you mark the, the nodule, the location updates, and then as soon as you mark that location updating, you get your augmented fluoro image. And now it's just it's it's candy after that because you just take your, your your scope and your catheter and you aim towards that. And as Mike said, you don't you don't have to do it just in the AP view. You could you could navigate an AP and then turn it to a little RAO. You could turn it to a little LAO. You could just see where you are in all three dimensions. You don't have to do extra spins. And two quick so, points before we move on, Joe. Yeah. So yep. if you remember Joe's talk about um, the radiographic techniques or, or technologies that are available, he talked about digital tomosynthesis or tomosynthesis. So basically, that's what we got when we're doing our spin, right? We're getting all those individual shots. And if you break that down a little further, and if you're using something, you know, whether it's a spin you're doing with your C-arm, or whether you're using a SIOS where it, it's spinning automatically, you're essentially getting cone beam light. Right, because we're getting the same kind of images, but we're getting a, a sweep. Now, with with tomosynthesis, it's generally a, a smaller sweep than it would be with the SIOS or with the cone beam. But now we've we're, so Joe talked about tomosynthesis. He talked about cone beam. But now the additional is you take that CT scan that was done pre-op and later updates and superimpose that on. So now you've got the augmented fluoroscopy. So we're hitting really every available radiographic technology all in one nice, neat procedure. So we talked about how this uh, works with uh, uh, any fluoro system. What we're going to do is we're going to show you in the next three slides uh, um, the CT scan images, and then the images generated from um, from uh, body vision. And uh, we'll ask you to like quickly in three seconds, just try to figure out which one, and then we'll show you the answer. So, so oh, sorry, Mike, I uh, uh, <laughs> I skipped the slide. That's, that's that's coming up in a second. So Whoops. we talked that we talked a lot about all of this. So we talked about the tomosynthesis. And if you look at that very first column on the left hand side, what that's breaking down, very, very basic breakdown is digital tomosynthesis. So this is something like a lumicite. And, and there are some other variations as well. But what you get is an image quality that's okay. Right? It's much better than what we used to have, which is plain old 2D C arm fluoroscopy. What's nice is the low radiation dose. We get some type of, of stereoscopic uh, impression there, and, and the cost is not much, right? So that's nice. Now, if we jump all the way on the other end, the, the two on the right-hand side, they're looking at um, cone beam or mobile cone beam, right? And in those, what we get is a better image quality, but we that comes at the cost of a lot more radiation. And we get a nice full 3D characterization and reconstruction of that image. Um, but it also comes with a pretty significant expense. On the fixed cone beam, that, as Joe said, it's over a million dollars. On the mobile cone beam, like a SIOS, it's about half a million. Now, the second one uh, from the left is basically what we're looking at with the lung vision. So we're getting an image quality, and we're going to show you some examples of the image quality you can get. And some of these are with an old, beat up, basic C arm, some are with SIOS. And as I, and as Joe said, we're gonna walk you through some of those. You get a 3D reconstruction. You get this without a lot of radiation, radiation that's more online with, with your standard tomosynthesis, a lot less, as Joe said, anywhere from five to 10 times less than what you get with either the mobile CR, mobile CT uh, cone beam or with the fixed cone beam. Uh, and it also comes at a cost that is comparable as well. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. Now, what we got are images on the left and the right. Now, what we have here, one of these is a preoperative, high level, thin cut CT scan. And the other is a reconstruction using the augmented fluoro digital tomosynthesis that comes with the lung vision system. And can anyone out there sort of identify which one is which? So I'll let you guys take a look at that for a second. We're not going to do a poll. Do the Jeopardy song. Like yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. So there you see on the left is the pre-op CT scan, and then this is the SIO spin imaging on the right. And I think most folks would agree those are pretty comparable. I think knowing now you can see there's a little more detail on the left with the pre-op CT. But overall, for something that comes at a, a cost that is about half of what the SIOS is, uh, it, um, it, it's, it's not so bad. So let's move on to the next. And again, where we have our images on the left and on the right, one of these is going to be from a standard C arm, a really basic C arm, and the other is the pre-op CT scan that was done in that thin cut, high resolution format. 
There you go. This time on the right was a CT scan. On the left is the GE 9900. Again, a fairly standard basic C arm, but you can see those images are pretty darn comparable. Let's move on to the next, Joey. And again, here we are with another set of images. And this one, um, the OEC, again, also a, a pretty standard C-arm type. I think on this one, you can see a little more detail on the left uh, going along with the pre-op CT scan. But again, the amount of radiation on the left versus the amount of radiation on the right is, is a five-fold difference. And still, because of the reconstructive capabilities of this system, we get a pretty good image. One of the things we didn't talk about was part of the algorithm in, in this system is, is a component of AI learning. And the more scans that go into the system, the more it learns how to process not just the nodules, but the vessels and the other uh, findings that we have in the chest. And the more that this happens, the better the image turn out to, to be. We can move on from here, Joe. Yeah, I just want to I just want to reemphasize um, this. The G9900 is an old analog uh, fluor fluoroscopy machine. Uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, I don't know how I'm not going to say how old I am, but uh, but I'm old. And when I was in my fellowship, I, I was using the GE9900. So uh, this has been around forever. And these are the images you're getting. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it, it, th these images are really state of the art in, in this space. There's, there, they, uh, uh, Lung Vision is really the, the market leader in, in image reconstruction. I mean, outside of a, of a cone beam CT, obviously. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I kind of get shocked every time I see these images. I just can't, I can't believe them. I can't, I can't speak more highly of, of the work that they've done over the years to do this. Um, yeah, during um, during your fellowship, you used the, one of the prototype flexible bronchoscopes, right, Joe? Yeah, with the eyepiece, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, just sort of driving home the point that we can get really good imaging with this system. Um, it's not just with those solid nodules that you saw. What we have here are sub-centimeter nodules on the left-hand side. And you can see there's a lot of detail and we can really discriminate that individual nodule itself. But also on the other side, it's a sub-solid, a partial solid ground glass. And even with, with that kind of more of a, a whiffy kind of appearance, we still get a, a pretty good image again. This is with basic CR and technology that is now being processed and uh, and giving us real time intraoperative imaging. I know, I know, we know Dr. Blanco. He spent some time with us here in, in Cleveland, and he has a. This is off, I believe, a um, uh, a GE 90, 9900. Um, so uh, this is uh, off of a, a analog system. The images on the right. I mean, it's pretty. I mean, it's a GGO. It's pretty impressive, I have to say. So, um, okay. Um, look. Uh, uh, how does intraoperative imaging, you know, and, and targeting and, and how does it help you? Well, obviously, it helps you. I mean, the, if you look at the bottom with with no ancillary imaging, you know, yields are below 80 percent. The moment you start adding um, uh, the moment you start adding targeting and 3D imaging, your your yields, uh, your yields uh, uh, shoot up pretty significantly um, when you use uh, um, uh, uh, even when you use the ro the, you look at the robot yield when you have you know augmented imaging to 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 go along with it you know both ion and monitor both uh, you shoot up into the ninety percent range which is very very close if not similar to what the IR guys get in in the IR suite so as Mike was talking about before we're pretty much simulating what the IR guys are now doing we're 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 focusing and, and relying a lot on tool and lesion getting you know targeting getting the tool into the lesion having radiographic confirmation of tool and lesion and this uh, uh you know leads to uh improved outcomes and imp improved yields um this is our 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 uh experience with 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 lung vision um this well i mean it's almost like three years ago two years ago now that that, that we did this and uh, we've had lung vision for a while, uh, several iterations of it. And the Im as the imaging was getting better over time, and this study was done a few years ago, where the imaging still wasn't uh, where it was, where it is today. But even then, um, we had, uh, uh, you know, we had good imaging overlays. And um, you know, here's our data. You know, we had a a pretty routine or pretty standard um, patient population, Midwest pa patient population. So lots of uh, lots of benign disease and histoplasmosis uh, type of uh, granulomas in this population. We had a, on a conservative definition, we had an overall diagnostic yield of 79%. And as the software improved and the imaging improved, we were able to crank that up to almost uh, 88% um, with the latest software, um, which is very similar to what, what, what they have right now. 
Um, I, you know, I think obviously that's when was, I started doing them too, Joe. The what? I think that's when I started doing them too. When the yeah, perhaps went. yeah, it was probably the addition <laughs> of Mike to that. Yeah, for sure. Our procedure times, you know, we're we're super we're super fast, you know, because you kind of move through this uh, pr pretty quickly, um, and uh, and no significant difference in diagnostic yields uh, below twenty millimeters, which is also pretty impressive when you think about some of the robot data, which which really drops under 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 twenty millimeters. Um, and this just, just shows you a, a graphical representation of what we had. Um, so look, uh, as we get into this, I'll segue Mike uh, into this. Um, the, the, the cost of, 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 of this uh, lung vision is the cost, its savings is very, very significant, right? Robots and comb beams are very high end, very expensive uh, type of technologies. And, um, you know, do we always need a robot? And I think there's a cautionary tale to learn from the surgeons. And, and Mike's going to talk about that over the next few slides. Yeah, I think we all love having additional technology. And I think every one of us was enamored when robots first came out. And, and not that we aren't still, because it is a phenomenal technology. But um, the next two slides show a little bit about robotics in general. This is not just bronchoscopy. And if you take a look at the graph on the left, this is a number of systems that have been put in place and delivered uh, in hospitals. And if you look at that from, from 2010 to 2017, that rise is astronomical. And these are systems that are being dropped in hospitals. Now, on the right, what you see is the use of these. And again, incredibly high usage and, and, and going at uh, an incredibly fast rate. Now, particularly in the US, now, that's fantastic because I think everybody that has had an experience with robotic surgery, robotic bronchoscopy, realizes there's real value there. Uh, but, but where do we have that value? If you go to the next slide, on the next slide, every time we use a robot, there's an additional cost. Regardless of what that procedure is, when we add a robot, that procedure costs more. Uh, and Again, this is all robotic surgery, but in a recent publication, if we replaced all conventional procedures with robotic procedures, there would be an additional $2.5 billion spent on annual health care. That's just in the USA. Now, in all fairness, the USA is increasing their use of robots at a much higher rate than any other country. But $2.5 billion, those resources just don't exist. So I think there has to be some break on how we utilize these resources because these resources are finite. And if we go on to the next slide, Joe, what we look at are, are two different sides of this, right? There's the capital purchase, which everyone knows you have to fight for. Uh, but the capital purchase, when we're talking about a robot, and this is any robot, and the addition of something like a SIO spin. And I think if you talk with folks that have been using uh, primarily the two robots uh, that were first out, they felt like adding something like the SIOS, and, and now there's an integration with one, uh, and then uh, potentially some work with integration on the, on the other. But you're looking at over $1 million, around $1.2 million, just in initial capital. Something that's a little bit simpler, uh, like the lung vision, that cost is a whole lot less. Now, that's the capital purchase on one side. Now, on the other side, there's also ongoing costs, right? Because it's not just you buy this and then every procedure you do from that point on is free. But the additional cost per case depend on a couple of things. One, it's your contracting, right? Because different places will have different contracts, but also the volume of procedures you do. So if you're a place that does more procedures, then the cost per procedure is going to be a little bit less. And why is that? Well, there's a cost for the individual pieces of that robotic bronchoscopy. Each scope comes at a cost needles come at a cost. That's sort of fixed per procedure. But there's also an additional yearly servicing contract that, that comes with, without insignificant expense. So if I do 10 cases with the robot a year, that per case cost because of that yearly contract is going to be a heck of a lot higher than if I'm doing 150 cases a year. Now that is also a big difference in, in cost per procedure when you break down the robot and the SIOs versus something like lung vision. And we move on to the next slide. So again, these numbers vary a little bit, but facility fee for a bronchoscopy, again, depends on local contracting, but it's somewhere in the range of $3,500 to about $6,200. Now, there are some factors that will, will come into play there, but if you're looking at lung vision, 
and depending if you use a lung vision catheter versus one of your thin scopes in a radial EBUS, which may already have been purchased in that capital, that's not going to be a significant individual procedure cost. But there is a, a definitive procedure cost per robot. And again, this varies a, a lot on, on how you go, but that can have a big impact on what your bottom line is and how profitable your administrators look at your individual practice. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that looks at one particular center. Joe did an analysis at our center, taking a look at what costs were for us using one of the robots, but then also using uh, something like lung vision. So Joe's going to take the next slide. Yeah, so we, what we did was, is we just did a financial audit of what we were getting paid for once we started with the with this at the new hospital. And, and obviously uh, we looked at contribution margin, which is which is a which is a calculation that looks at, at costs and reimbursement fixed cost reimbursements, and if you remember what your direct costs are of a procedure, it's 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 the it's the capital um, that you use during the procedure, so the cost of the scope, the cost of the forceps, the cost of the needles, so on and so forth. But it's also the cost of the of the OR that you use that day, and the nurses and everything that kind of and the, and the anesthesia and everything that goes into that. And uh, the scenario one is just uh, just just where the only fixed cost is 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 the lung vision versus the ro ro robotic scope. So you know whether you're using a, a lung vision uh, catheter or you're using a robotic catheter, and uh, and you could see that lung vision outperforms uh, robotic scopes um, because it costs less with the same reimbursement. Um, don't worry about scenario number two uh, per se. This is just uh, this is just an analysis of making sure that you you bill the right you know you you bill it correctly so you get the right uh, reimbursement. Everyone who's doing this, if you do a if you do a transbronchial needle transbronchial biopsy uh, with what any platform, you're going to get APC five one five five. That's a whole other webinar for a whole other day. But scenario three is 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 uh, scenario one is just uh, Medicare payer uh, payer. Uh, scenario three is a provider mix uh, that would be mostly managed care and managed care generally pays more than Medicare. I took a conservative number of 1.5 and again, you could see that that that, you know, it's profitable. So um, so again, as Mike was saying, uh, same reimbursement, but less cost. And I think that that's that's when I moved to this new hospital and I was ready to move from from EBUS into into nodule uh, bronchoscopy. I had to remember I had to think through all this. I'm in a smaller regional hospital, maybe not as much money as the main campus. How much can they afford? And 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 what's the profit margin that they're going to see? Uh, because that that affects their ROI. I couldn't go into them and say I'm starting a program and I want 1.2 million dollars to do it. It was a lot easier for me to go in there and say, hey, I need $200,000 to do it. Uh, where could, it's a lot easier to find that money than it is to find uh, uh, $1.2 million of capital. So, um, uh, and that's what we uh, started off with. We started off with uh, Love Vision. And, and look, uh, if there was a case, and uh, we'll talk about case selection uh, here, but if there was a case that I didn't think was 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 perfectly appropriate um, for lung vision, and I and I needed a robot for that, I just I just sent it to the main campus, and eventually I got a robot because I was so busy with with lung vision. Uh, we ultimately did get another robot uh, at the regional hospital, but now I could now I could mix and uh, uh, pick and choose. Hey, it, 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 is this something I really need a robot for? If not, I'm going to perhaps go to a a lung vision. So so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the decisions. And uh, what I'll do is I'll read through this. I'm going to sneeze. Sorry, excuse me. No, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so, Mike, let's just kind of go through this, and and you can give your opinion. If I have anything to add, I will. How do you decide sure. which technology? So you have you at main campus. You have everything at your disposal. You have a lumosite, two robots. You have a you know radial ultrasound. You have lung vision. What are the things that go through your mind when you're walking into your room to do that nodule biopsy? Sure. Uh, answer that in just one second. So I also want to just reiterate that flash message came by from Victor. Uh, there is a chat room that's open. So if there are questions that folks have about anything as we've talked about this, put them in there and, and we'll go through them, make sure that we answer every question you guys have. Uh, so um, feel free to to throw any question out there that you want. But, you know, Joe brings up a good point because as we both have said, resources are, are not unlimited. So um, I, I think Obviously, the bigger something is, the less likely it is to need a robot. And we've known that from the very basics of uh, conventional peripheral bronchoscopy. 
uh, we knew that when a lesion was bigger, we were more likely to get an answer. So I think the first thing you look at is, is just the, the size of the nodule. Uh, where is the nodule located? Because there are certain locations that historically are much more of a challenge. Something that's in the superior segment is going to be a, a tough turn, a tough one to get. If we're talking about CT to body divergence and movement of a nodule, uh, just peri procedure, something that sits down low on the diaphragm is also going to be more of a challenge. Additionally, the upper lobes, particularly the apical and particularly the apical and medial, it's just hard to make instruments bend that way. I think everyone that's on this has seen those images of that extended working channel out there uh, pointing right at the lesion, but then as soon as you put that instrument in, it straightens out. So there are some that having the uh, additional stability of a robot are, are going to be useful. So those apical, those medial ones, those ones that take really hard turns where the instrument's more likely to move your catheter are going to be better suited by a robot. Uh, but again, when you're making these decisions, things that have to come into consideration, one is, is how good are you at each technology? Because you've got to be honest with yourself. If you are very good at robotic bronchoscopy, but not good at catheter-based bronchoscopy, then that should be part of your decision process. Fortunately, Joe and I and, and most of our partners have a lot of experience with multiple technologies, mostly because we're old and we've been around for every iteration of every technology <laughs> that's come about. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think being honest with, with what your actual yield is, and that, in, that involves you actually taking a critical look at yourself and, and how do you do. But nodule size, I think, is the first one. Location is the second. And then characters that, that come into play with uh, with the CAT scan. Is there a bronchus sign? Uh, is there a vessel sign? Is there something that, that makes this kind of stand out as I can get to this um, without a whole lot of difficulty? And then that's going to take into consideration how much time do you have for the procedures because you don't want to deny some people procedures because you're doing a longer case. Uh, and also what kind of budget are you working on? Uh, because these things, although we'd like to think they don't play into our decision process, they absolutely do because we've got to keep the lights on. Uh, Joe, any comments on that? No, I think you hit on a lot of things. I, I think that uh, I, you know, obviously, if there's a, a large a large uh, nodule with a you know air, multiple airways to it, why do I need a robot for that? Um, you know, I could I could do a lung vision much 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 more quickly, uh, much more effectively, and. Uh, um, you know, I, I, and much and much more cheaply um, than uh, than with a robotic scope. And I, I default to the I default to the lung vision if I see something like that. Even a more a modest sized nodule. If there's a if there's an airway that I know I could get into and get down on and it, and there's an air bronchus sign. Um, me personally, I'll I'll try to default to the uh, uh, to, to lung vision. Now, look, if there's a if there's a um, if there's a nodule small nodule intermediate sized nodule that you know has no airways to it which i know i need that fine articulation of a tip i'll i'll, I'll obviously use the robot now if i'm at if i'm at our main campus and i have everything available to me i'll probably use a robot with um with uh um uh Body lung vision because i get the added benefit of the augmented image or the augmented fluoroscopy which i i don't get with just the uh the standard integration that exists right now so even even though i using a robot i'll still use the lung vision but yeah, I think and I'll, I'll throw that out there as well joe you know for all of my cases uh all of my robot cases i'm using lung vision in addition to if i'm doing it in the procedure suite you know the one day a month that i get down in the cone beam obviously I, i'm not using it but uh, otherwise uh, it's going to be the lung vision that's being used with the robot uh, if I'm using the robot. And then in some cases, it's going to be the lung vision alone. Again, that that sort of speaks to the both agnostic uh, and and also the, the wide range uh, of its uh, capabilities. Now, uh, in this, I, I talked a little bit about robots and, and, and Joe touched on it as well. But the one thing that I didn't talk about was the use for intraoperative imaging. So uh, if I've got one of those that doesn't have an airway, as Joe mentioned, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have this on a cone beam day, now those are the ones that I'm looking for for cone beam. I don't want one that just has an airway that runs right to it because I may need to stop and change my angle. And, and again, the beauty of the intraoperative imaging is you can change your angle, not just in the, I want to be more medial or lateral, but I also want to be more anterior, posterior, and, and really kind of fine tune it and, and tweak it to, to get your approach in the most dead center uh, spot it can be. And that's where the real-time imaging or intra-op procedural imaging comes into play. 
Yeah, it's not a lot of that at a time, you know, do this. Uh, look, you uh, you have to get the patient anesthetized. Um, you, uh, without even putting your scope in, you do a quick uh, spin. You identify the main crina. It takes about a minute, if that, to do that. Once you do that, uh, then you have to move your fluoro to where the nodule is. That takes a little bit of time, another, I don't know, minute. You do another spin there, update your location. And really within, you know, three to five minutes you're uh you have an you have a an updated you have an updated uh a nodule location you have a, a fluoroscopic overlay you have a uh, you have an airway overlay and if you kind of know where you need to go boom out you, you're there and then if you're there and it looks like your needle is once you send out your needle or whatever biopsy tool you use and and you're within that overlay in two angles right you put out your needle say an AP, I want to make sure that I'm still in and not in front of it or behind it, I'm in the middle of it. I could spin out to 30 degrees. And if I'm still in it, I might not even do a tool lesion spin because I know that I'm in it in two planes. If I want to, I could do another spin. And that just, that takes another minute and a half to do. The reconstructions happen very quickly. If I really want the confirmation of the, of the and I need the confirmation of the tool and lesion, I, I could do it very, very quickly, which is why our procedure times are, are, are so quick. Even if I'm doing it with a robot, um, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll do my target updating even before I put the robotic scope in. I'll go in and just and just aim the the, the robot out at the uh, you know out the nodule. So, so two, uh, two questions from me, Joe. If if you're done there. Yeah, I'm done. Uh, so first one is how often do you and how quickly do you change your plane or do a repeat spin after you've done your first pass? Um. It, we have rows, so um, if 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 on my first pass or second pass, I'm I'm not getting anything. I will uh, I'll do a I'll do another spin. Um, if uh, uh, if um, I think there's been some nodule movement during the procedure, and you can it, the nodules will, will will move around all over the place during the procedure. If I think it was a a big movement for whatever reason, atelectasis is developing or something, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll do another spin. And I think so, that's important because uh, also depending on where the nodule is, right? If you've got a nodule that's in a more dependent spot, if you've got a nodule that's closer to the diaphragm, they're more likely to do some movement. And, and one of the reasons I brought this question out is because in the early stages, I made this mistake. I would do one pass, I'd do a second pass, and I'm like, well, you know, I, I think I could be a little better. And I would end up moving the robot, and then the call comes back positive. <laughs> and then my third pass is no longer positive. <laughs> if I had just stayed in that spot and waited to hear the rose call, I would have had no, no issues at all. Um, so I just throw that out there for folks that are, are starting out in this. Get your rose call if you're fortunate enough to have rose. Otherwise, you know, take a few passes and then make your change. Um, and now let's say, Joe, so um, you leave Cleveland Clinic. You get offered a lot more money to go to a smaller community hospital to be the head of bronchoscopy services. And, um, and yes, say, I accept. OK, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully none of our bosses are listening. And, uh, and hopefully they are. The, <laughs> the CEO comes up to you and says, all right, Joe, uh, I've got a checkbook here that's blank. It's got your name on it. Uh, we want to start a bronchoscopy service here. How do we do this? Yeah, I think when, you know, this this question gets asked of us, all of us at Cleveland Clinic, you know, a lot. And and I think that if you ask five people, you might get five different answers. However, I, I, I'll i start by saying this. Um, if you're going to start a program somewhere, there there's no there's no blank checkbook, right? There's there's always a limit to how much you could spend. And uh, if, if if you're buying an EBUS, you obviously need an EBUS system. You can't do anything without EBUS. And that's that's a significant chunk of of that checkbook right there. So you have to then decide, am I going to spend another million dollars on a, on a robot SIO system, especially if you don't have a, a cone beam system? Um, or am I going to, or that will, you know, help me with uh, um, the majority of, of my nodules. Um, but, but do I feel comfortable going with like a lung vision that will get 70 or 80% of my nodules? Um, and by doing that, saving money, having a better cost uh, um, uh, or contribution margin per case, right? You could leverage that cost savings into bigger and better things down the road. Um, maybe you don't want a robot next 
texting. Maybe you want to buy a, a, a cryo system. Maybe you want to buy, a, you know, um, I don't know, um, a set of um, Richard equipment, so on and so forth. So so when I first started at the regional hospital, we didn't have a blank check. You know, I, I had to be I had to be frugal with what I got. So I started with a long vision. I showed that we could have a nodule program. I showed that the nodule program could have growth. I showed fiscal responsibility, the hospital liked that. And that led to, you know, generation of a very positive contribution margin and expansion of the program and into the next phase. So um, look, I mean, everybody, everybody feels and, and does things differently, but but um, uh, uh, I feel that it, it, you have to be financially and fiscally responsible when you do these things. What you don't want to do is, is, is create a program that's going to lose money because then you'll never get any money after that. So um, this isn't a technology, lung vision isn't a technology that you could only apply to 10 or 20% of your patients. I think it's something that you could apply to the, a good 60 to 80%, if not more of your patients, depending on where you are and, and what you're doing. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's a really solid number, especially if your diagnostic yield is going to be in the high 80s. What do you and think, Mike? Joe, uh, at, at Fairview, what percentage of cases are robotic versus lung vision alone? So when we when when we just when we had lung vision you know for the first year before we had a robot um, of all my referrals uh, roughly eighty percent of them we kept at Fairview and maybe a small fifteen or twenty percent we uh, we sent to uh, main campus for a robotic scope and those those were you know small nodules remote areas of the lungs no air bronchi sign um, it was uh, it was the minority of patients most nodules in, in our that we were doing in our that came from our uh, screening program or incidental program were all 15 20 25 millimeter bigger nodules very easy to get with uh, with a lung vision and you know from the standpoint of main campus uh, you know, we had about five of us three primarily but about five that were using lung vision uh, and then we had an additional what uh, so about nine of us, 10 of us that were using uh, one of the robots in, in some shape or form. So uh, there, there's definitely a higher percentage that we're using robots as opposed to lung vision individually. Uh, so maybe more of a 75-25 robot versus lung vision there. Uh, but part of that was because of, of the training and the comfort uh, and experience yeah. with each of the technologies, just in case any of the folks out there are wondering what the breakdowns actually are. Well, I mean, look at you, Mike. When when you for, for when you were first doing this, you were doing a bunch of you know monarchs and robots. You were super comfortable with that, and then and then as you got as you started to incorporate lung vision into your practice, you, you started to I think I think uh, you your case mix started to shift, and you started to do a lot more uh, uh, solo lung vision cases and, and less of the robotic cases. So I you know I look to you as as you know. A good analogy here. Uh, yeah, and, and going to the power. point, I'm I'm a huge fan uh, of of the Monarch. I, I think it's got a, a a lot of a lot of advantages. Uh, I'm I'm in the minority at our center, uh, more our ion users. But what I have found is that you know there are some some uh, dings in 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 the system, the Monarch, uh, but those are overcome in a phenomenal way by adding lung vision on top of it. So it's one of those examples of, of the agnostic adjunctive uh, uses for this. And, and I think it, it's been been a great way uh, to take uh, by procedural competency up a level. Yeah, I agree. You know, the, the initial Monarch data, it was somewhere between a 75, 70 to 75% yield, 77% yield at University of Chicago, you know, and, you know, big time users there. Sean Stoy, who, who took it, uh, to, to his shop in, in Minnesota, added uh, body vision, and, and you know he's publishing a paper of like 92% yield with the Monarch. So the, clearly a significant bump. In, in, the, in the last few minutes, Mike, uh, let me. I just want to ask you what you think about the. You, do you think radiation dose is 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 important, and 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 a mitigated radiation dose? Do you think? Do you think that's important? I mean, a lot of bronchoscopists kind of blow it off, but but but. But I think a lot more people are starting to pay attention to it. So what do you think about that? Well, you know, and this is is only my personal opinion, but I I have been one of those folks that have blown it off. But I see a lot of people blow it off. And I think that's because our training and historically we're exposed to a couple minutes of radiation from a, a standard C arm. But now 
as we're incorporating things like a SIOS and cone beam into it, we're getting radiation doses that are approaching those of our IR colleagues, not quite at the level of our EP colleagues or, or cardiac cath colleagues, but you got to think about, you know, the effects on bone and, and more importantly, like on cataracts. So I think there's a lot of factors that we hadn't traditionally thought about, but as we add these technologies on top of each other, we're probably going to see more and more of this. So it's got to be part of what we do. When I do the cone beams uh, down in IR, everybody scatters out of the room, right? Because we don't want to be exposed to any additional radiation. And, you know, you, like me, we've been doing this for 20 plus years uh, and 20 plus years at 150 to 200 cases of peripheral nodules and, and radiation, you know, that adds up over time. And um, uh, so I, I am much more aware of the exposure today than I was uh, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. All right, look, it's uh, it's 8.02. We're, we're, we're just a minute or, or so over. We're going to wrap up here. We want to thank everybody for doing this. We want to thank um, uh, Body Vision for uh, for sponsoring this. I hope everybody got out of this um, what they're hoping to get out of it. Um, uh, uh, most everybody should know how to get in touch with me or Mike. If you have any other questions uh, offline, we'd be happy to answer them via phone, email, text message, whatever. Are, yeah, are there um, any questions out there now, just uh, in the last minute or two? I think we're good, Mike. I think I've been monitoring the questions coming in. I think we touched on just about everything that came in. A lot of great questions from everybody out there. We really appreciate it. So happy holidays, everybody. And um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you on the next one. Sorry. Ugh. He just saw a mouse. Hey. Hey. Okay.